Hello, this is James Hudnall, and I am here with Mike Barron, and we're going to be talking about all kinds of stuff. Unfortunately, uh, Val Merrick won't be able to do, be with us right now. He was still having technical problems. We'll figure it out. Hey, Mike, how's it going? Good. Let me just check the um, the live thing so that it's working. How's it going? There right. it is. I see you. So let, let me, me just, just check the. Um... It's on delays. That's why it was playing back the sound. Okay, so I turned down the sound. That's just so I can monitor any chats that come through. So, all right, great. Um, so, how you been? Good, thanks, James. How was the blizzard in uh, Denver? <laughs> oh, you know, it was. I was down there for a convention over the weekend. Uh, I had uh, dinner with my old friend Larry Hama. Uh, and I came back on Sunday. It was very hairy. When I left uh, Denver, it was snowing and there were cars piled up all over. But the further north I drove, it slacked off. And by the time I got to Fort Collins, it was sunny. I see. Oh, that's good. Nothing I hate more than snow. I can't stand it. <laughs> but um, I got to get over there sometime. I haven't been to Colorado still. I don't think I have. I've uh, been to Colorado. I've been to most of the states in the U.S. I don't know why I wouldn't be in, have been in Colorado. I might have went through like the top corner when I was a kid or something, but I'm not sure. But um, so anyway, let's let's start with the big one. Yesterday, Stan Lee died. Uh, did you ever meet Stan or work with him on anything? Many times. Uh, I met Stan in 1972 when I interviewed him for Cream Magazine. And then years later, when I wrote for Marvel, uh, I'd run into him at the conventions, and I'd always say, Stan, you, you may not know me, you may not remember me, but I, I write for you. I work, I write The Punisher. He says, oh, yeah, yeah, of course I remember you, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Val said something similar, that he's met Stan a couple times, and Stan acted like he knew him. He, You know, he assumed that he was he knew him, but... Okay, good. The camera's working now. Um, yeah, so um, I, I've i never really met him, but I sat next to him at Jack Kirby's funeral. He actually uh, came in late, and I was sitting in the very back with Brent Anderson. We came together, and uh, he came in, like, after the service started, sat down next to me, and then uh, as soon as it looked like it was, it was finishing, he got up and left because he didn't want – he knew that there was a lot of people there that didn't like him, especially yeah. Kirby's. So, but he wanted to give his respects, which is nice. Sure. But um, I didn't. He just nodded at me. I didn't really change exchange words. I could have met him many times, but to be honest, I, I just didn't really know what to say to the guy. He wasn't the one that I personally. I was more into like Kirby and the artists because I felt like they had more to contribute to this. Marvel classic Marvel stuff, but also I'm not really a fanboy. I mean, I love comics and everything, but you know, especially now that I'm professional, I just I'm more interested in t hearing about the business from old timers, hearing their stories and stuff like that. But I don't really care about the fanboy stuff of of what issue this happened or whatever. It's, I don't really care myself. But um, so but yeah, it was great that you got to uh, talk to him. Um, a lot of people did in the industry. I just I didn't really seek them out that much, but so uh, so you're really active lately with some stuff. I mean, you're always pretty active. As long as I've known you, you've been you know you're not Chuck Dixon active, but you're pretty active. Um, so like, what's what what have you been up to lately? Uh, at the end of the month, Liberty Island will release my novel Disco about a boy who adopts a mongrel pup and trains it to be world disc dog champion. It's a heartwarming tale for the whole family, which I wrote because years ago I turned to my lovely wife, Anne, and said, why won't you read my comics or novels? She says, I can't read any of that. It's all so horrible, so grim. Write something I can read. So that's one of the reasons I wrote Disco. And also uh, in memory of some great dogs that I have, uh, and then uh, a, couple, a month or two after that, they will release the fifth and sixth uh, 
novels in my Bad Road Rising series. The first one is called Biker. It's about a reformed motorcycle hoodlum, goes to prison, finds God, comes out, turns his life around, but the only work he can get is delivering summons. Uh, but people keep coming to him with their problems because he knows how to get things done in a street-level, quasi-legal manner. Uh, and you're all familiar with the type, and it's inspired by Travis McGee, the great John D. McDonald character, which is probably my main influence and the reason I'm writing today. Uh, but if you like Philip Marlowe or um, Lee Childs, uh, Jack Reacher novels, uh, anything like that. It's in that tradition of uh, a series of adventure novels. Uh, they're quite grim. Uh, I'm working on some new projects for cautionary comics. Uh, one is called Offworlder, and the other is called The Wraith. And I have a little Offworlder art here, which I'm going to place on your Facebook page. And you can scoot it on over. I don't know how to do that. I'm so technically challenged that it's a miracle I can talk to you now today. Yeah, actually, I don't have, uh, I have a program that allow me to put stuff up on the screen and stuff during this live stream, but I haven't mastered it yet, so I haven't started using it yet. I'm just, I'm still learning a little bit about it, but um, uh, somebody's PM me on uh, Facebook. But um, yeah, that, you know, definitely um, check out my Facebook, which is james.hudnall on Facebook to see Mike's page um, and also check out bloodyredbaron.com, which is his website, right? That's what is that the Bloody address? Bloodyredbaron.net. Net. Okay. That's she, good. She uh, did you see that art I just PM'd you? Oh, there it is. Oh, you PM'd me it. So it's not on my public page. Okay. No, I, uh, know, beyond my modest capabilities, like I keep saying, you think I'm uh, Tom Swift. <laughs> I think I just, let me just uh, do it like this, the old-fashioned way. So this is the art for Outland. Oops. Oh, it's upside down. It's reversed because it's a video camera. Yeah, yeah. But that's, that's, that's it anyway. <laughs> we'll, we'll figure it out. I'll, I'll get it. I'll get it fixed. It's a very nice-looking cover. Yeah, Jordy Armengall. In fact, I am going to post it on your page so anybody who's on Facebook now and is watching, they can see it. Oh, I can't post on your page. You have to post on your page. Yeah, I have it blocked because I just, in case there's too many wackos out there that try to take over your page, you know, with their craziness. And yeah, I, just, I know what you mean. I have those, but I tolerate them. I'm so tolerant. Well, now I'm, I used to too, but I now I'm sort of like, no, nah, not anymore. <laughs> I'm not going to, it's just too much of my t energy. I don't need to waste on stuff you know, people that are angry for no reason, you know, but, um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't get too much of that anymore because I mainly, I don't post politics on Facebook on the main. Right. I just don't really, uh, I don't feel, it's just sad that you can't have a conversation anymore without it being some kind of ridiculous. I know. Group, you know, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so that looks great. And you and is this a comic or a book? It's a comic. Cautionary is putting it out in the spring. They just finished uh, Ravager, which Chuck wrote. Okay. Uh, and yeah, and they're they're getting that printed and preparing to send that out. And this will be the second cautionary title. Yeah, you know, despite what the what Jordy wrote, it's off worlder. It's not off lander. It's off worlder. But that's the cover. Looks good. What's cue ball? Can you tell me something about that? A well, cue ball is a, is a project that I put together with Barry McLean, who lives in Denver. Uh, we crowdfunded it earlier this year. It's a martial arts espionage comic, uh, born out of my lifelong love of martial arts and my determination to show them accurately and in an exciting manner in comic books. And it's uh, about uh, a guy named Curtis Ball who joins the Merchant Marines and ends up managing a warehouse in Manila. Uh, and one night, some thugs try to muscle in and demand a package, and their paper's all wrong, so he won't let them have the package, which leads to fights. Uh, but the package contains a Chinese dissident who shipped herself out of the country. 
Uh, she's been being hunted by the Chinese government uh, for exposing human rights abuses. And her name is Red Crane. Uh, Red Crane and, and Curtis hook up and go on the run. Uh, Curtis is cue ball. His name is Curtis Ball, and they call him cue ball because he's a pool shark. Uh, and when we first meet him, he's playing pool. Uh, he's also a lover of, of Kali Escriba, which is the Philippine martial art that relies heavily on sticks. And uh, a lot of the martial arts that we show is Escrima from the Philippines with, with stick drills. Uh, but it gets into a lot of other stuff beyond that. Uh, it's a five-issue series. We've been picked up by Antarctic. I do have copies now from the Kickstarter, but it will be reissued in the spring with a new cover. Uh, and uh, uh, Barry just finished the second issue, penciling the second issue. Barbara Kahlberg is the inker. Uh, and Mike Kilgore is the colorist. Uh, and Barry is an explosive artist, explosive. Uh, and anybody who's not familiar with him should go to his Facebook page and look at his art. Barry McLean Jr. Yeah, I saw the art. It looks good. And it looks looks fun. Yeah, it is fun. I saw that picture of you with uh, some guy that I guess is playing cue ball or a C or he's just. Do you mean that little figure? The little figure? No, there was you with some black guy. I thought he was. That's Barry. Oh, okay. So, um, well, great. That's it's good you got you got that going, and um, and you got like uh, you got some other books that you mentioned that were coming out. I mean. You're pretty prolific. Um. Well, I don't know how prolific I am. It seems to me I haven't had a comic book in ages, you know, but I do have a bunch of stuff in the works. Yeah. Well, so do I. And I know how it is. <laughs> yeah. I've got, I've got stuff that's, I've been, I just got multiple things going on. It's, you know, it's just finding the time. So I'm trying to shuffle between, I'm getting it done slowly but surely. Right now, I'm working on a screenplay for somebody. It's a funded movie, but I have to finish it um, about halfway or pre about a, quarter, eh, a third of the way, I guess, maybe more. Anyway, I'm going to focus on that for, till the end of the year, so I'll probably get that done by the end of the year. Um, and uh, I've got a bunch of projects, and Agenda is the big one that I'm promoting right now, which is my new Kickstarter, I mean, Indiegogo project, Agenda is... Um, yes, yes, I know about Agenda, and I urge everyone to back it. Yeah, great. I just brought it up because I have to pimp it on every video. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, but we can talk about you. It's not all about me, so... Um, yeah, I'm glad we finally got this going because uh, we had, we did one of these and I didn't do, do it right because I, I didn't realize I had to have Google running at the same time. I didn't know I had to launch it from Google. I mean, from, uh, yeah, from Google, uh, uh, YouTube, I mean, sorry. I had to launch it from YouTube and so it didn't record it and we spoke for like 40 minutes. Yeah, right. But um, we can... Uh, Oh, somebody else is PMing me now. Is that you? No. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that is me. <laughs> is that one you just sent? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that looks good. So that's – that's is that related to that book, biker series that you did? Is this book Which series? If Sons of Bitches, is that in the same series as your biker novels? Oh, yes. Yeah, Sons of Bitches is a biker novel. I just uh, PM'd you a picture of Barry and me. That's what I PM'd you. Oh, I did. Okay. Yeah, uh, but, actually, you PM'd me a bunch. Yeah, this is a picture I saw the other day. Yeah. Yeah, but I'd be happy to PM you the uh, Sons of Bitches cover. Yeah, you did that. I, I have it here. Oh, I see. It must have been an older one because I don't see it now in my thing. Somehow now you will. There it is. Yeah, there. Okay, this is a different cover. The one I well, just, yeah, yeah, I showed you the uh, Dave Dorman cover. Oh, okay. Yeah, that looked good. And I see your art for uh, Cubo, it looks like, that you sent me. Or is, which, this, yeah, this is Cubo. Yeah, the art looks really great. Very nice. 
kind of awkward for me to swivel this around, but um, I can. This is some of the art for cue ball. It's huh, pretty nice. Let me just get this back here. It's a little awkward. I I, I want to get a thing where I can switch back and forth. I actually have two screens now, so that's why I can switch back and forth. But I want to get it where it's on this. It's on the. It's on the thing. Are you sending me more stuff? That's me. I'm trying to get out of this. Oh, I have to X out of it. Okay. All right. That's it's, that's enough. That's yeah, all the yeah, stuff I'm going to send yeah. you. The Dave Dorman one was the one I saw earlier. Yeah. Oh, Fred Patton. Did he die? Oh, I just saw that Fred Patton died. He's a guy that uh, used to be with. Um, the CFO when I started back in the eighties, I was into anime and he introduced me to the CFO. Well, he didn't introduce me to it, but I met him through the CFO. He was from LA. CFO was the cartoon fantasy organization and they, and I was really into anime back in the early eighties. And I tried to introduce a lot of people in comics to anime. And I did actually introduce a lot of them. Um, and, uh, this was way before anyone else was into it. Um, and Fred was, uh, yeah, he was there, and he he'd been having some health problems for a while. He was in a uh, a group home, is I think last time I talked to him. Sorry to hear it. Yeah, he was a nice guy. He's a little odd, but he was a big fan from the old days. He was born in '47, and he was like a old timer fan of comics, and I mean science fiction, every you know everything geek related from the from his teenage years so he was into it for a while and he knew all the la people so he knew forrest ackerman and all those people really well and um he had lots of stories about fandom in the early days because he used to go to conventions back in the 60s and stuff so anyway now let me switch back to your screen because i'm <laughs> it's got all these screens going okay good yeah and so now i'm seeing it's i got a Tilt this thing again. This thing is kind of the way it's set up. I gotta, I gotta mess around with it a little bit. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, uh, anyway, what's what's up with you? Other than that, anything you want to talk about? Well, uh, let me see. Um, I'm working on a Nexus novel. Oh, yeah, I saw that you were, yeah, back on that again. But you're working on a novel. Who's publishing it? Well, nobody. I'm just writing because I was sitting there one day and I wasn't working on any novels. And the one I was trying to work on, uh, it wasn't working out for me. Uh, so I, I've i always thought of doing a Nexus novel. And I had the idea in my head. And I thought, well, why not give it a shot? So I started and I'm very happy with it so far. Uh and all f the all, everybody who likes Nexus will, will, is going to love this novel, although it's drastically different from the comic book because it's a literary experience. It's not a comic book experience, uh, but I think I can pull it off. Hmm. Yeah, I, th I thought I read something that you and Baron, I mean, um, the dude were working on something recently. Was, was that my imagination? Or? No, it's not. We're working on Nexus. Oh, okay. Who, who, for Dark Horse? Yes. Well, dude originally commissioned it and published it himself in a, a very uncommercial format, uh, 17 by 22 inches. Impossible to ship, impossible to rack. He also rewrote all my dialogue. He was the editor and the publisher, and he exercised his prerogative. Oh. That's that project. Okay, I remember that from last year, or was it early this year? So. Now uh, Dark Horse is going to bring it out next year, uh, and I'm happy about that, but it's more his vision than mine. Uh, and then we have some new material we're working on. That's good. That's your, probably your longest-running series, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's the longest running series. We created it in 1981 and it's probably the longest uh, uh, lasting independent superhero title there is. You and I uh, met in like 86 or, or it might have been 85, but I think it was 86. 
So you were working before that then? You were working all that way back to the 81? Yeah, but I think we started publishing with Dark Horse in 80, with Capital in 82. Okay. Well, that's still pretty early. I wanted to get into uh, about 81, 82, but I uh, waited until I got my break with Eclipse because the, it was just a little overwhelmed by all the details back then of publishing. I wanted to do a color book, which would have been a failure because it, it just costs too much money to do it properly and you have to have distribution and all that stuff. And the industry was still a... Uh, well, it's a mess now, but it was a mess then too. And but it had they had lots of distributors, but they you know they were all soon to end, not too much longer after that. So yeah, the big uh, bust out where all these distributors just flamed out for a while. In the yeah, we were just discussing this on Todd Mulrooney's show earlier today, and in fact, Todd is listening to us right now. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was on that show the other day. Yeah, we definitely, uh, that's a good show. And um, it's uh, it's good that we now have the ability to communicate like this and to get our word out to the world because the whole world can watch this. And it'll be archived, so it can be, it'll be out there as long as YouTube's around. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to download all the videos from YouTube and put them on BitChute and some other sites so it'll be in, available in different areas as well. So the archive is not going to be lost very easily, but um, future generations will thank you. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. I just think that it's great that we uh, we creators, independent creators. I consider myself an independent creator. So do, so are you, and a lot of us now have, are doing it anyways for various reasons. Aside from, there's no point in working for the big companies if we can avoid it. I mean, I can. I don't blame anyone who does work for them, but I, you know, it's. I think we're better forging our new path for the industry because the industry, we can't trust the so-called leaders of the industry because they're leading it down a cliff, down to a, leading it off of a cliff, you know. And we need to keep it going. We need to keep the comics alive and fresh and interesting. And uh, for to do that, you need new exciting ideas and characters and that's where we come in we, we have the ability to do that and um i think it's great that you know we have a voice that we and we have the technology now where we can publish and get our financing and do a lot of things ourselves where it was before it was very a very hard uh it was very difficult to do that um the playing field is much more level. I mean, we don't, um, we have to just forget about the uh, direct market because I don't know how long that's going to last, the way it's running, being run. Uh, to be honest, I mean, it's it, the company, the industry has gone through some strange upheavals since I've been in it and you've been in it. <clears throat> and uh, it's amazing it's lasted this long, but. You know, I, I don't think it's it'll die necessarily. I think we have the ability to keep it, to re rebirth it in some way. And I think the artisanal comics that people are doing now through crowdfunding, I call them artisanal comics, but they're sort of like craft beer of comics, you know. I mean, they're just like specialty things that people that are, that are into it and can get it and... Uh, it could be supported by a group of people who basically we become small companies that, are, that other people, that fans can come in and they can make it happen, you know, and they can make their own, they can make comics that they want to read instead of just accepting the stuff that's handed to them by the big publishers or just throwing you stuff that most of you, a lot of people just don't, aren't interested in, you know. Here, here. Yeah, it's like we don't have. Well, to we got a. Hey, how's it Go going? Ahead. Good. What What I'm really hoping for happens is that um, there's sort of a next level of Indiegogo, maybe uh, f financed by somebody else that has uh, a procurement center of itself. You know what I mean? Whereas they take care of all that. 
they take care of you find your printer you have it shipped to them and then they ship it out because if you oh, can take that exists. the printer it, that i'm using yeah it exists. a printer i'm using is a company that will also print it does high quality printing they're in georgia and they fulfill all of the stuff so they they will send the stuff to all your crowdfunding uh per people that bought perks they'll ship it to all those people except in the case of sign books or things like that then i have to we have to have it shipped to us so we can sign those books and then send them out but but for the general shipping and stuff they'll do that and it's also print on demand so it makes it a lot, a lot more affordable because uh we just send the order in and we we know exactly what it is but any new orders that come in if people want the book they can order in that for a reasonable cost for us uh we can get the book to them and uh it's it just eliminates the need for distributors really that's great because that's what i've been thinking about the whole time is how many how many hats do i want to wear as a creator uh how many things do, yeah you know I don't, I don't, I don't want to have to spend my, my, a lot of my time doing the business end because it's just time consuming and everything. And I want to just be able to be creative as much as possible. I don't have a wife, so I don't have somebody to manage that stuff for me. Um, <clears throat> and the idea for me is like, I want to, you know, I don't want to bring you two comics a year especially not of my comic. You know what I mean? I want to try to bring you six. I mean, granted I'm wearing a lot of hats. I'm inking, I'm coloring, but I don't want it to be one or two times a year. Cause that doesn't serve any, that's not going to serve any audience. Yeah. The, well, agendas I'm planning to be a quarterly comic, but I am planning to do more than that. I'm planning to, uh, I have other projects that I'll be doing as well through this company. So, agenda is basically the first of hopefully many things and and the idea of freedom forge which is my company is uh oh uh, i guess mike's gotta go yeah boys it's been a joy but i gotta run uh, no problem thanks mike i appreciate it thank you for having me on great no I, thanks for sending me the invite i hope I, I didn't mean to jump in on anything i just wanted to to speak about that a little bit. Yeah, let me just. This is Todd Maroney, by the way. He did the cover <laughs> for my book, um, "The Secrets of Writing," which he did a great job. Um, and uh, yeah, it's fine. Uh, yeah, we can talk. Um, so, what we? Where were we? We were talking. Oh, about we were we were talking a little bit about um, agenda and and the idea of meeting, uh, trying to do a certain amount, and then you obviously you hinted right. towards another project that you're in the work so that you're giving people more content um, and then sort of even feeling out the waters of far as well. This seems to be a bigger hit. Let me concentrate more of my time on this, maybe give you a spin off of this. Uh, and, and that's kind of what I'm thinking of is like, um, you know, but I'm only the artist, right? But uh, um, the idea from my book, uh, Ignition is, is a 22 page feature and a 10 page backup where I give you different things in the backup. So as you stick with the feature, if I can hook you with that, then you'll start to see other characters in the universe. Um, and eventually what I wanna do in the first uh, like six, seven, eight issues is, is show you some characters that you see in the feature, show you some characters that you see in the backup, and then I wanna create a straw poll. Which, like, whose origin are you interested in? I'm trying to steer them towards something, but I want to see what kind of response I get back. And, like, oh no, we want to see Hollow Point's origin or, or something like that. So, I'm trying to break that veil of giving you more than just a book, give you something uh, more of a product that involves content, your interaction, your ability to communicate with me, sort of break that whole veil down of uh, creator and fan. You know, that's the whole idea. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I um, <clears throat> I've thought about that as well as you know. There's a lot of things that want to do. Of course, there's only so much time and energy, but um, I think that's good. I mean, here's the thing: there was a time, you know, the time that I grew up in, um, comics did that. They they would have like a feature story, and they'd have a back. If you look at the old Marvels and DCs, they would have like the front would be the main story, and then there'd be like a backup story in the right, right. 
And I think it's, you know, and, and the idea was so they could showcase other characters. <clears throat> and um, in fact, if you go back to the 40s, which is before my time, but, you know, they had like uh, the comics were thicker and they had like six stories in them uh, of different characters. You know, action comics was originally an a about action comics. It wasn't just about Superman. It was about a lot of different characters. And um, Detective Comics was called that because Batman was just one of the stories in there. Eventually, those characters took over the books, but they were originally about a lot of different characters. So the companies could basically create all these different properties that they could explore and all these characters. And um, I think it's just a good model. And uh, the main thing is just the critical thing is uh, for publishing is you have to be consistent and keep it coming at a reasonable schedule because if you look at uh, the people who are successful at self-publishing, it's people like uh, um, Dave Sim with Cerebus. He, he was able to manage to get those books out every month regularly and so it's uh, Robert Kirkman with his books he's he's been able to get his books out regularly and the quality's been good same with uh you know Cerebus they were able to to keep it flowing at a reasonable rate so and they were able to build up a pretty good fan base doing that now it's you know it's not easy to put out a monthly book but if you can just keep a schedule like you know um uh, American Splendor with um that would come out like about well, once a year, but he came out with it every year. And so did uh, Peter Baggs, Hate, and, you know, he came out. And then uh, Dan Klaus with his books, Hate Ball. So, I mean, uh, if you just keep it coming on a schedule, people can depend on it. You can work it out, you know, it, it can uh, develop into something. But I think that um, the more you can do, the better, as long as you don't over burn out or overdo it. Yeah, that's, you know, obviously the idea um, is, you know, obviously I have to self-prove myself to myself too and then prove myself to the audience or anybody that I'm able to, to keep uh, keeping sort of any base I can build. You know, if I can keep them and keep you entertained, then that'll sort of drive me a little bit more too because it's one thing is like i talked about this with mike is wearing a lot of hats can kind of burn you out because as an artist the page you're on is the best the page you like the most and so so now i'm i'm, I'm trying to do an indiegogo 42 pages so when i draw like i'm on my next page right so i'll bring up two or three pages that are ahead of it so i sort of keep the flow and remember where the blocking is and all that I'm looking at pages I no longer have liked as much. So not only that, when I get to the point where, okay, I've inked all the pages. Now let me get my coloring hat on and sort of uh, get a flow going with that. Now I, I don't even want to see these pages anymore. I'm so sick of them, you know? So that's the really hard part because doing, you, know, you don't have the machine behind you and and maybe you don't have the, uh, uh, for instance, if it does sort of go well on Indiegogo, then I'll give up coloring. I'm not the greatest colorist. I'm sort of a passable colorist, um, but not that I wouldn't try hard and, and actually get better at it over time. But I don't consider myself, uh, I just consider myself passable, you know, when it comes to that, you know, definitely I've tried some, I'm trying some things that are unique to uh, the type of character being that he's a fire character. I'm trying some unique things there where like you kind of see the avatar I have is the idea that his skeleton is really glowing through his skin, that this isn't um, a fire that's on the outside. It doesn't come from that. It's more of a molecular level fire. So I, I have different things in the works. The character is not just a, a Johnny Storm. He is a, a sort of a, a amalgam of Johnny Storm and Green Lantern, where he can make constructs with his fire. Um, so yeah, getting, getting, man, my plan is to try to do, I'd love to get up to six. I'd love to get up to six issues a year, but you know, that has to, I have to prove that to myself too. I can't just say I can do it. 
I don't really even know. I'd love to be able to get to the point where like, okay, it's monetized, everything's going well. I'm gonna turn this coloring over to somebody. I, I've actually s sort of stalked a colorist who I know can do this very capable. I've seen him do the effects uh, of fire and, and, and things like that really, really well. Um, but you know, it's hoping, there's a lot of hope. I do like, like you guys were talking about the market and and how Indiegogo or crowdfunding has changed the game. I just wonder if there's another level to it. Well, there is, um, it's evolving and it will continue to evolve. And uh, as far as being able to put stuff out on the schedule, you just have to develop a system and you have to stick to it. It's a discipline like anything, like working out or something else. You got to. You got to do it. You got to set aside a certain time and dedicate yourself to that time. So like some writers, they start working at like six in the morning and they work till eight, nine, and they just produce X number of pages and then they do something else. And then they come back and do a few more hours or, the day. you know, everybody's got a different schedule. Um, with artists, you got to dedicate more time than that. Then, but, um, you know, you just got to figure out what your work day is and stick to it as much as possible. And um, you just, once you get the rhythm down. Now, what, how do, what is your process? Talk a little bit about it. Well, mine is kind of scattered because, you know, I have to work a day job. And uh, so, but I'm not always working a day job. So sometimes I'm not working uh, and I can work as I feel, but um like right now I'm working a day job, so I work during the day and then when I get off I work, but mainly I do a lot of my work on the weekends as far as the writing goes. I try to get a lot of stuff done on the weekends and uh, I, don't know, I work a little bit an hour or two at night, um, but I usually when I get up I just go straight to work, but when I'm not working then I can work you know, all day if I want to, or as many hours as I want to. And it's just, like I say, a matter of discipline. You got to say, I'm going to work from here to, from now to the X number, you know, till six or whatever. It just depends on how much, how I feel like sometimes the flow is, you know, you're working and you just feel you're into that zone and you just want to keep going until you're tired and don't want to, you want to stop. For me, that's kind of how I work is i I try to get into that zone because that's the important thing. You gotta, you gotta be able to focus, and, and sometimes it takes time to build to get into that state of mind where you're you're just constant focus on the work, and not distracted by a lot of things. My problem is I tend to get distracted by stuff. Um, I try not to do that, and I've gotten better at it. I've, for example, um, play a lot of video games and I used to watch a lot of TV. I don't do that anymore. I play video games maybe for an hour or two, uh, not every day, but when I, when there's a new game out, I'll play that for it. But then once I get done with that, I go back to what I'm doing. But um, as far as TV goes, I don't have, a, I just cut my cable a couple of years ago and I don't miss it really. I just watch a few shows, which I can get on streaming and I just, um, I just don't have the distraction of all that stuff. And I find that I really don't need most of it because it wasn't this. I just watch stuff that's good, really good. And I just ignore everything else that me marginal stuff. I've just pretty much cut it out of my life. And you really feel more free and more it actually makes you feel better to get rid of that junk. Cause a lot of it's negative and a lot of it is, it's not constructive. It's, and it just, a lot of bad influences, you know, a lot of it is just hack and it's just a lot of bad, bad work, you know, and it's just a waste of your energy. No, I, I agree. I, I don't even turn my TV on anymore. I used to like to draw to it. Uh, what I'm probably drawing to more now is just listening to shows like this, at giving advice and, and learning uh, business aspects of this whole thing is more more in my need, you know, it's, it's something I kind of need to do so that I make sure that I don't misstep or, or, you know, I, I have sort of a lead in what to expect. Uh, for instance, you just talked about a printer a little while ago and, and now I know, whoa, there's a printer that'll actually act as a procurement center too at the same time. So I'll, I'll be contacting you for that information too. Yeah, because, I'll send that to you on Facebook. Yeah. yeah it's pretty that's, that's definitely the, the idea of this community as far as um, what we
we've sort of aligned ourselves to the idea that uh, these people want certain types of books and they don't want certain things in their books. So the, the, the outside of that um, feeling is these creators that are involved, willing to share and help bring you on their show. Uh, that, that part of this has really kind of got me and sort of taken me back a little bit um, to sit there and talk to Mike Barron for an hour uh, on, on my show. That's just, you know, just floors me to talk to you floors me, you know, because you guys both won awards in this industry. And to me, to, that's the, um, you know, that's the pinnacle because it's not, it's, it's not, a, it's a thankless industry other than the fans, the interaction with fans. That's, that's where it's probably really at is meeting people and, and getting them, them say, Oh, your work really inspired me or this that, and the other thing. But the only way in the business from your peers is to sort of be either even nominated or receive an award that says, you know what, your work stood out and it stood out because of this or that or the greatest single issue or yeah don't get wrapped up in rewards because a lot of it is just I, I the way i describe the comic industry is it's a lot it's um a lot like high school except more depressing because <laughs> basically it's you know a lot of clicks and a lot of you know politics and everything and um i just i just i'm not into that so I was not, I'm not a big, like super sociable person. I can be, but I'm not, I don't go out of my way to be. So um, as a result, you know, the industry kind of favors people that, that are in certain cliques and they all sort of give each other pats on the back. And it's really, a lot of the people in those cliques aren't that great, to be honest, in, in, in a lot of those cliques. And they just sort of like push the narrative and everything and, um, so a lot of things that get awards, they might deserve it to some degree, but not as much as other people do. I mean, there's always better stuff. I mean, for me, it took years of getting recognized and just being, I felt like nobody was paying attention to me. And then uh, what would happen is I would do a book and then years later after it was done or canceled, some people would come up to me at a con and tell me how great it was. And I'm like, where were you when it was coming out? Cause, um, you know, you, you, you can feel really lonely sometimes doing this stuff, but you know, the, the key is persistence. You gotta keep it going. You can't be you have to focus on just producing. Producing is the key. And the more you draw, the better you're gonna get. The more you write, the better you're gonna get. The more you color, the better you're gonna get. You know, you've got to keep doing that. You have to focus on the work and not on the fame or any of that stuff because that's ephemeral. I mean, uh, when I was working on the ultraverse the first year of that was great as far as the claim and everything uh we would have i went i remember one went to one signing in anaheim and there was a line around the block for me and mike baron not mike baron uh, mike Barr, and uh somebody else i forget who else was there but it was mike Barr and myself and i think a couple artists and uh it was at mile high had a store in anaheim at the time and the line went around the block. I mean, it was a giant line, but I didn't, I realized that it's not about me or Mike even. It was about the idea of us or the idea at that particular time of that this book, these new books might be hot. And so everyone lined up to get the signatures, but it's just hype, you know, you gotta, you gotta separate yourself from the hype and focus on what, because I'll tell you what, the people that get remembered, the people that put in the work and, and try to better themselves, it's not going to be the people that are just hacking it out to get noticed, you know? I mean, those people are going to be forgotten, a lot of them. Uh, I think, you know, I've worked hard on my career, not as much as I would like to have done. I would have liked to have had more opportunities, but you know, that's just here or there. I can't do anything about that. But, you know, I am respected and I know that my work, a lot of it stands the test of time. And it's just a matter of me producing as much as I can while I can. And then hopefully in future generations, hopefully we'll be there to like it. And um, I can't really focus on the now because here's the thing, you know, a lot of people that produce work, 
it may not be appreciated. I mean, you're young. I'm like 62, almost 62. And <laughs> it's just, you know, I've been doing this a long time and I'm still not where I would like to be, but it's not really my choice. It's, it happens or it doesn't. And, you know, there's a lot of famous people who are ignored in their life, like H.P. Lovecraft and Robert E. Howard and um, uh, what's his name? I keep forgetting, blanking on his name. The guy who wrote The Minority Report and um, Blade Runner and Philip K. Dick. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's like a trillion TV shows and movies based on his stuff now, but he died impoverished. You know, he died broke and he was struggling his whole life. And he went through all kinds of stuff. So, I mean, like a lot of people that are considered great later, they're not appreciated in their time because they're ahead of their time. I always consider myself ahead of my time. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to catch up to my time before it's over, you know, but I can't really worry about that. I just have to keep on keeping on, as they say, you know. Well, well obviously, um with Esper's, you had a following. It it, it, came, it kept coming back and sort of getting getting rebirthed in that sense, and and that wouldn't have happened if it didn't have yeah you know poor audience. Yeah, I just the problem is is that um, the first series I did, I didn't have any money, um, and they and Eclipse didn't pay us, and they gave us some uh so it had to end because i couldn't pay the artist because i was i took responsibility for paying people so i had it took me a couple years to pay back david lloyd the money i owed him and he gave me a lot of help for it <laughs> although we're good friends now but um and also john m burns was another artist who did one issue and he did a spectacular job but we didn't get paid and so you know, and that's the problem you have, especially with a lot of fly-by-night publishers. Eclipse wasn't fly-by-night necessarily, but they were not good at that. Their, their uh, business. Tony? Yeah, well, it's just they were, they were like two brothers. I mean, Cat Iron was the editor, but the two brother, Millenni brothers, the one brother was like the accountant, but he was just not, he was the guy that was not, handling it too well. I don't blame Dean because he was, I think he was a great publisher and ahead of his time in a lot of ways. But um, yeah, the, um, but that's the thing. A lot of publishers you can work for may not pay you or may take a long time to pay you. I've, had, I've been through that a bunch of times. And so it makes it hard for you to keep it going. Or in the case of a writer, it's hard to keep the artist interested if he's not getting paid, you know, and I don't blame them at all. But you know, like I say, it's important to keep the work coming. So in case of Mike, in, you know, when I was doing Esper's for Image, uh, it started off great and I was making good money, but then it slowly kind of trickled off. Um, I don't know why that is, but I think it's, you know, it's just that's you got to kind of, the industry, well, part of it, I think, was the industry was going through its horrible collapse at the, in the mid-90s. That's part of it. You know the the whole industry was sort of tank because there was like just a glut of, of universes and they were all crashing. Like you know, every company had their own little universe there right. for a while. And uh, when the book was that image, did it have one artist from? Yeah, Greg from Horn. Actually, one. Greg Horn. Yeah, yeah. Greg Horn was the artist, and then uh, when Greg left to do something, he wanted to do his own book, and so. Um, I did about three or four issues with other artists, guest artists, and they were good, you know, uh, but that the other problem there was getting the book to come out like it did before because Greg was good about the schedule. Um, and I was kind of getting burned out by the, just the difficulty of trying to keep everything going. I had like a couple other books going to like Devastator and Actually, Greg worked on Devastator. That's right. He went off to work on Devastator with me. And I also had a book called um, Shut Up and Die, which is a crime book. And only had three issues of that. But I really enjoyed doing that. But again, wasn't selling that well. It was a little ahead of its time for a crime at that time. But um, And then I was doing Age of Heroes. But again, the, we weren't making it enough. And the artist was having trouble keeping it going. 
So we did about five issues of that. And fortunately, that stuff is really good. And the artist John Ridgely is coloring it now. So we're going to collect it. And I'm writing a, a, a six issue. So we're going to have a collected trade out next year sometime, hopefully. So well, that'll be great. Yeah, the key is, the thing to remember is, this is really important, produce work and it will always exist. Once you produce it, you can repackage it later. You know, if, even if it does, if it loses money the first time you do it, because a lot of my books didn't make any money, but they made money over time because I was able to repackage them and I was able to option them to Hollywood and stuff like that. So I've actually... Um, I've actually uh, slowly recovered from projects that I've done. I've gotten, you know, options for things and they just kept me going, you know, for a short time. Uh, and, uh, and it also helps my prestige. Every time I get a deal or something, it gets, puts me up the ladder a little bit. So the key is just to keep producing. And my mistake was that I stopped producing for like a lot longer than I intended to. And it's just because of life, you know, years just fly by, especially the older you get, the faster time goes. It's one of the cruel ironies of fate is that the older you get, the faster time goes by. For me, a day is like I get up and then next thing I know, it's six o'clock, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, that, it starts flashing by. Of course, it can do that if you're just busy anyways. But the main thing is, your key to your career is you got to keep producing something and not give up. You have to be persistent. You have to be determined that this is what you want. I mean, I, I call it a calling. I don't call it a career. It's something that I, I'll tell you what, I feel much better since I started doing all these projects and they're starting to come out. I feel much better uh, when I'm actively engaged in creative stuff. I feel uh, re rejuvenated by it. Um, I really do believe that it's important to your psyche, at least for me. I no, feel I get that. I get yeah. that. I've read a lot of your posts and, and you know, back when you were having a health crisis and um, the healing wasn't always going as well and, you know, eventually got around to everything working out. Um, but yeah, I can see where that would affect your mindset and then your way out of it is being creative and engaging this this creative community and stuff like that i can definitely see how that i can see in your post how that sort of transcended and 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 the ship started writing as far as your as your mindset yeah the thing is i really like talking to people and i like engaging people and it's just that i'm not a big um I don't go out of my way to like socialize, but I do enjoy socializing. I'm more like into one-on-one -on -one conversations. I'm not really into big parties. I'm more into like small gatherings of people because I like being able to talk to people. I don't like noisy, you know, like going to a place where the sound, the music's blasting so loud you can't hear each other talk. I hate that stuff. I've always been more into like stuff like this, just engage one-on-one -on -one because for me it's it's much more in interesting um and i'm more into like stuff that's meaningful you know meaningful conversations that actually are about something and the same with my work as a writer i try to make it about something th that uh that i can relate to and i feel that that's another key is you have to produce things that people can relate to um yeah let so ask, let me ask you a question about your work because i noticed through through uh reading up on, on on some of your work is like you like to take a different perspective um like for instance the uh, uh unauthorized biography of lux luther was from a journalist journalist point of view and how he needed to try to get like he wanted to uncover some things so he he thought well let me get superman to help and, and and we'll get to the bottom of of uncovering the misdeeds or or a deviant side of lex luther and that was just a, a unique thing for i mean not you know not that it hasn't been done but it was a really good take on that and, and a lot of your work has that sort of let me 
provide a, prof a fresh perspective that you don't normally see. Yeah, that's my goal is a to find an interesting way into it and also most fiction just takes like the easy route and they they just take obvious directions uh paths to get to point from point a to point b <coughs> i mean it, it, especially in like mainstream entertainment so but there are stuff that i've always been attracted to are writers who don't do that and they they really take you down different roads and different rabbit holes because it's a more interesting journey and you find out different things that you wouldn't have found otherwise so you know one of the reasons i wanted to do the lake sutha thing was i wanted to i really liked lake sutha as a kid uh he was more of the scientist in a gray outfit like onesie or something and um he was not like the character from the 80s but i worked with that because that was what the character was at that time but um i like the idea of somebody who was a, a legitimate threat to superman but he had no powers that's what i liked about it and also he was really intelligent he was on par with superman's intelligence uh, because at that time superman was really intelligent so and then there was you know the main problem with Lex Luthor was his ego and his, you know, his hubris, and, and that was his downfall. And I thought there was a good kind of moral lesson there. But I wanted to do a story where there was no superhuman. <coughs> excuse me. There was no super superhumans in it necessarily. It was just a straight crime story. And even though Clark Kent's in the story, Superman's in the story, just as a blur, I wanted it to be more about people because in that world, there's people and we should recognize the regular people in these worlds. And unfortunately in comics, one of the things I find is that uh, everyone wears a costume and they almost don't associate with normal people at all. Like the stuff that I grew up with, uh spider-man stories were about at least a third of it was about his normal life and the rest of it was about his superhero life but there was always stuff about his normal life his girlfriend and his you know school and all that stuff and, and the other books also at that time they would spend some time on the character's normal life so it was more connected to the real world but in the 70s a lot of these artists who are, I mean, writers who are fans who got work at Marvel and DC, they just made the stories about uh, every single person was wearing a costume and they didn't interact with regular people at all. And the stories to me were just like Byzantine and didn't go anywhere important. And they were just kind of like grudge match stories. And I just kind of hated it. And I lost interest in comics in the late 70s because of that. I only got back into it because uh, I just sort of, out of nostalgia, I picked up some comics and saw the books, and that was kind of interesting. But, um, you know, it's like, uh, to me, the path to a good story is to make it about something that people can relate to. And I don't think, you know, bread matches between people and costumes that have powers is interesting on its own. You know, you have to look at those Marvel movies. They're successful because you go back to the old formula of Marvel, which is, yes, they, you have all these people with superpowers, but they, you do see some of their real lives and you do, it's sprinkled in with the story. So there's more to it than just Thanos and, you know, Loki and whatever, being bashing people around or whatever. I mean, they managed to mix it in. So there's stuff for people to get into. And then, you know, the average person is getting into these movies because there is something to hook them in. It's not just, you know, big fights. And um, so that's been my philosophy from the beginning. And I'm glad to see that it's sort of being recognized in some quarters. But, you know, as far as the mainstream comics now, they sort of lost that thread, I think. Or they've, they've kind of taken a different, they've taken a, the wrong view of things. There's sort of like a, um, an overarching uh, 
ideology that's threatening all of entertainment at this point. And I don't think it'll last. It's just a phase, I believe. But um, this whole like uh, progressive kind of ideology push where they're trying to just ram all this stuff down people's throats and it has to be in everything. And people don't relate to that and they don't agree with it. And it'll it's being rejected. You know, for example, the new Doctor Who is a woman, and that's the range went off because, first of all, just forcing gender switch on on a character that's been established for like forty something years, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, they 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 push this on it, and they don't even do it well. The writing isn't that good, and you know, nobody's buying it. So people, are, it's just dropping. Their ratings are just nosediving. And it's going to happen with you know, Star Wars. Look at that. You would think that would be invulnerable, right? But it's it's crashing because people are just sick of the the unimaginative, derivative, and progressively forced ideology on this stuff that doesn't have. It's in another galaxy. Why would you need to force all this crap on the story? <laughs> it's not even mm. the universe, for crying out loud. I have a question for you. If tomorrow you came up with a really good, say, Superman story, now, do you think uh, if you flushed it all out, created a pitch, do you think ageism is something that would keep you from being able to get that pitch into the right person's hands? Or do you think there's enough cachet to your name that even though there's some newer editors and they're kind of a little bit different or whatever, they're, you know, that like how what would be your avenue how much red tape, tape would, would it take for you to get to the point where you say got it into mike carlin's hands or, or well i know mike carlin i mean i worked with him in the past so that's not a problem but he doesn't have any power as or an editor he's not been an editor in a long time oh yeah they pushed him sidelined him years ago well he, to, to be honest i don't think about it i don't worry about it i'd rather po make my own path but um yeah, I think there would be a problem for me, and it's not just ageism. There's sort of there's an openly racist mentality of these people that scream about racism and sexism and everything. They are this racist and sexist. They they don't want white men. They don't want you know heterosexual white men, and they you know and they um, they for example think that a book about a black person must be written by a black person and all this other dribble. It's nonsense. I mean. It's all about the talent of the individual. It's all about individuals. It's not about race. It's not about sex. It's not about gender. It's not, I don't care about any of that stuff. I don't, I never have. I've never cared about if somebody's gay or, or anything. I've never cared. I just care. I look at people as people. And that's the way I've always worked as my stories also is I look at the characters. I mean, I've had multi-ethnic characters way before anyone else. I mean, I was working for Trick with Moratori. I had Sikh characters. I had, you know, Indian Sikhs. And I had uh, people like ethnicities that are not even normally touched in comics. I was doing that, you know, Cambodian or whatever. I've done all that stuff. And I didn't do it because I wanted to tokenize that. I just thought it was an interesting way into the story to have somebody with a totally different worldview. And that's just, you know, that's always been my attitude. And I really resent and just don't like the way they've been posing all this kind of tokenistic crap on people nowadays. And I, and just the attitude that I understand from people I talk to in the business, uh, editors, at some of these companies, especially Marvel's, Marvel's the worst. The current uh, people running Marvel, they're just like fanatics and they're not, I just don't see a point in talking to them. And for me also, uh, I wouldn't really, want to get in at those companies marvel or dc necessarily because it's all about them owning everything and they they just want to own stuff and they so they'll take your ideas and then they'll say see ya i mean they, they just they just like throw people to the side very easily there's no job security at marvel and dc for these companies they you're just there until they need you and then you're gone when they don't need you and i just you just have people aside, people that are really talented and people really good that that could produce really great stuff, and they don't even give them work because they'd rather give it to somebody, some some you know, somebody from like Tumblr who's a lesbian. They'll give them work. Somebody who doesn't even care about you know comics at all, 
but they they happen to do something about intersectional you know lgbt nonsense i mean it's like that is that is not there's no story there unless you unless you understand how to tell a story which they don't you know that kind of stuff is just to me kind of grotesque so do you think there's a you think the pendulum will swing back or oh yeah well think- it did swing back but it's it takes time you know it's it's it seems very hopeless when you're in the middle of it mm-hmm. and i certainly understand how some people feel they feel like uh you know will we ever be out of this mess i don't blame you for feeling that or you or anyone else <laughs> that feels that way i understand because i do see a change though it's see i'm old enough to remember something similar not as bad perhaps but when uh, the 70s when carter was president it wasn't quite the same but you know the com- country was really in bad shape in the 70s uh, you went to any part of any downtown in the u.s it was like a, a it was just so ghettoized and so run down like downtown areas were just like crim- crime was rampant and you know it was just really bad including downtown san diego where i live um i lived here in the 70s and i went to high school here and i used to go downtown to look for books and stuff and it was just like uh accessible you know it was like taxi driver type stuff and um then everything turned around when reagan got elected and and the country revitalized and we're going through that period where the revitalization is starting but it takes years before it really is felt. And um, of course there's a lot of resistance, quote unquote, but a lot of that, the people that are into that, to the extremes, they're just minorities. They've always been minorities. Extremes on both sides are minorities. The most people are just, they just want to live their life and they just want to enjoy their, they just don't want to be bothered and they want to be able to do what they want. It's these political people that are always messing things up and they're always making life unnecessarily difficult. For example, in California, they have these horrible wildfires right now. Well, you know, Governor Jerry Brown vetoed a wildfire management bill in 2016. If he had, if that had passed, uh, if he had vetoed it, it might have res- saved a lot of people's homes and lives that are dying right now, you know because California's done a horrible, horrible job managing things like water, you know, like Orville Dam almost burst a couple of years ago. That's because they weren't taking care of it because the money was being siphoned off for some of the ridiculous nonsense. You know, they got that stupid bullet trained in nowhere, which is never going to go anywhere. Um, so it's always the elites that are always messing up things. That's kind of why I did my comic agenda is about to kind of do a spotlight on a lot of things that I think are problems in the world that are generally ignored by most comics and, and literature or anything really. Most they're ignored by a lot of things um, because people don't want to touch those those areas. But I I'm doing it and I'm doing it in a way that hope that won't be out to attack anyone necessarily, but just kind of show people another side of the world that they're used to seeing. Do you um do you foresee that the you know like obviously there'll always be floppy comics or, or physical comics, but uh, is there a way to sort of uh, create a community of comics where it's not just uh, big publishers that survive? Why not have like this was my idea once like um, almost regional where okay, I have this issue I've produced here and it and, and I print it here, but maybe in, in the UK, you want to print it. You'd like to see it be part of your imprint. So it wasn't so much, you know, um, I try to ship it to the UK. I try to get your audience involved. It's that you saw it here and then you sort of almost lease it, like lease the ability for them to print it put their, maybe even they slap their own cover on it or whatever. Do you ever see something like that? I don't know what to call that. Almost like a consortium. Yeah, there's there's several different ways you can do that. There's, I mean, when I started, it was, I did Espers through Eclipse, but they weren't, they were the distributor 
you know, basically they published it, but it was packaged by me. So it was my book and it was packaged under their brand. You know, Image was packaged under Malibu initially. Malibu was distributing their books through Diamond initially. So in Viz, when they started, they, they started through Eclipse and Eclipse was publishing them. So that's one of the ways you can do it is you can uh, make a deal like a licensing deal with um, licensing deals. I think is what you're talking about, but um, you can also do packaging through a publisher. So you basically come to a publisher and say, I, I'm doing this book and can you distribute it for, for X number of, you know, can we make a deal for dis distribution? So it'll be in your catalog. It'll be in your section of the diamond catalog, for example. And mm -hmm. I'll just pay you a percentage of the whatever it makes. And uh, that's one way you can do it. Um, but uh, I don't necessarily um, recommend that unless you've got something that you think is going to do well. Because uh, especially now, even like Marvel and DC books that they own aren't doing well. So... <laughs> It's not, it's, I don't recommend doing that right now when the industry is in such bad shape, but it's a, it's a way to do it. The main thing, like I say, is you, can, you don't need anyone's permission to do comics. You don't need anyone's permission to publish comics. You can do it yourself and you can make it available in a lot of different mediums that didn't exist in the past. So you can do web comics, you can do uh, ash cans, and you can do, uh, you can publish them yourself. Or you can uh, you can try to do it through another company. There's a lot of different ways to do it, and also you can start it with somebody else and then later do it yourself. So you can do the books, uh, like for example, um, Warren Ellis did some book. I forget the name of it, but he did a book. He did it online, but then all of the stuff was collected and then published in print later. So there's ways to there's a lot of ways to do things, and it just like I say, it's just the key is getting your stuff published. Do you have um anything other than uh, agenda that you, you can act, that you've actually talked about or shown or work for? Yeah, like I, I told Mike earlier, um, I'm going to be collecting the Blue Cat series, which I did with. I did over at Aces Weekly, which is online, but I'm going to collect them all into a trade in print, and that's going to be next year. Um, it's going to be in landscape format because the book was done in landscape format, which is actually much more enjoyable to work with than portrait, actually, surprisingly. It gives the artist a lot more room to draw when it's like sideways for some reason. It just psychologically, it just it actually flows better. It's just a difficult format, but I'll just print a hardcover version, you know, landscape format. And I'm collecting the Age of Heroes in color, which John Woodry has been coloring very nicely. And, you know, next year we're going to put out a trade and collected that volume with some new stuff in it. And I've got a superhero series that I've been working on. Um, I'm going to work out on how we're going to do that, either self-publish it or, or work with somebody on that. Um, and uh, there's other stuff, too, that I'm thinking of. And I want to get a lot of my stuff out into new editions. And now that that's possible with the print-on-demand, I can get my stuff out and without having to spend, like, 20 grand on printing a trade. I can just print the trades on demand through Amazon or some other company. So the the... the ability to do stuff is greater than it's ever been. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that you're going to uh, introduce audiences to some of your older work and, and bring it, you know, bring it back out. Um, these it's always been my goal, but it's just been kind of difficult. And also, um, I didn't get the, uh, I didn't get enough people interested in doing it for some reason. I, I get this weird feeling that some people just I don't think it's they don't like me. They just, but um, I just not a like I say I'm not into anybody's clicks necessarily. So I'm sort of uh, if people I see a lot of people that are they got marginal stuff, but they can just get trades out all the time. So I, I just um, I think it's more like uh, who you know and that sort of thing. But anyway, 
I kind of got to wrap this up because <clears throat> okay. and everything, but um, it was great talking to you, and um, you know, we could do it again. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, as I get closer to um, launch and 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 actually trying to find a publisher, there's one or two people interested in in doing it. But as I get closer to that, um, I definitely like to come on and sort of have a a talk all about ignition and, and things like that, and have you ask me questions. So do you have a, a YouTube channel? I do have a YouTube channel. What it's is funny. it? So I can put it. It's funny because I was, I had um, Mike on at between six and seven. And so I, I was thanking him through the IM and I said, hey, I want to thank you for coming on. Da, da, da. And he said, oh, he sent me the link to, to your show, you know, because I was like, no, no, I just want to watch. He goes, no, no come on you know and i don't know why he did that but he did he was trying to get off that's why <laughs> maybe maybe that's what he was thinking so um yeah my youtube channel i'll i'll put it in the i'll put it in the chat okay um that'll make it easier yeah um, i'll put it in the description i'm going to change the description of this video to uh, mike Barron and todd mulroney because that uh, will do val tomorrow hopefully oh i'll be looking forward to that because i do know you have a lot of friends in this in this industry i mean I obviously did. from your era uh in, in the years that you you worked uh, actively there those are like to me you know um james these are the guys they call legends yeah you know, they're they they granted stanley and jack they they created the foundations but then you had to build the brick ladder after the foundation yeah. becomes the bricks and the cornerstones and all that and some of these guys were in on that floor and there are legends to me, I'll tell you that. Yeah, I'd like I'd like to get I, I used to interview people on a on a podcast years ago, but I was just kinda it was just kind of a pain in the ass to get people's connected, their schedules lined up and um it was all over the phone and everything and now we have this technology, it's much better. So um and it's easier because it auto archives. I don't have to spend a lot of time trying to get the production together and everything. Although I'm going to be doing a lot of my own video production uh, starting now. I don't know if you can see the camera behind me, but I got a camera and I'm going to start doing videos about writing and creativity. It's a series that I'll be doing maybe this week starting. and um, It'll be on this channel? Yeah. Of course. Yep. Oh, Eventually I might excellent. pull it off couple channels but right now i'm just putting everything in my channel oh by the way everyone please subscribe to this channel if you haven't already and click the uh, notification bell so that we can um you know you'll be notified when i'm doing something because i am going to be doing lots of two of the things i'm doing besides these interviews with people is i'm doing a series of cartoons i did one today and they're sort of like little animated cartoons and um i'm going to be doing at least a couple a week, maybe. Um, what? Let me see. Do you have one you can show? Yeah, I've got a bunch already on my channel. Some of them I did years ago, and I just did one. Uh, okay. It's called Street Theater, and it's it's just about, you know, like a couple people talking, and it's just a little dialogue thing. It's just for, fun for me to write these little things, and there's a program that I'm using that lets you animate it animate it for you so you just type in the dialogue and, and you pick the characters and then it animates it so oh, i gotta check this out That's used to be free but you gotta pay for it now but it's not that much i just uh, try them for a trial and see if i want to keep doing it but I, i'll do it for a couple months at least people i the reason i started doing them again i did them back like eight years ago and there wasn't that many people that viewed them, but now those things have been on YouTube for eight years and they're, they've got thousands of views. So, I mean, not like a lot of, you know, like 3000, but it's still a lot more than it did before. So I feel like, well, I should do them then because people are, re you know, they're responding to it somewhat. I'll have to check them out. There's so they're, they're, if I check videos on this channel, they're there early on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll check them out. I'll do that. Thanks for uh, uh, giving me some time to talk to me. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for being on. It's my pleasure. All right, I'll talk to you later. All right, thanks a lot, James. Bye.